I was just a uh, commodity sales rep in healthcare, and I was approached with an opportunity to join a business uh, called Automated Healthcare. Uh, it was spun out of Carnegie Mellon University, so I said, well, what do these guys do? I say, they make robots that, dispen that automate the dispensing process of pills in hospitals. So this is late 90s. I'm really not aware of this at all. So I said, I got to see this. So I go to uh, Lenox Hill Hospital, where they have one of their alpha level installations and everybody in the hospital is thrilled. The pharmacists love it because previously they were performing a task, uh, task routine known as a lick stick count and pour. Very highly compensated pharmacists stuck in a basement putting labels on containers, counting pills, putting them in there. Uh, and then it turns out there's quite a bit of medication errors being caused because of this mundane counting process. So, uh, this was a robotic system that was set up in the inpatient hospital pharmacy, networked to the pharmacy information system, did all the dispensing tasks. Now the, now the pharmacists are out on the floors influencing patient care with the docs, and hospitals are saving a lot of money. Uh, the University of Michigan Hospital actually became one of their clients. So um, at a very young age, I really grew up with that business, and at that time became a real uh, junkie of disruptive early stage business models, particularly those uh, centered around robotics. Um, back, at, uh, back in Pittsburgh, which you've heard a lot about today, um, you know, there's a lot of businesses that have spun out of CMU. Some have succeeded and some have failed. I've had the opportunity to consult with many of those companies and uh, Red Zone Robotics is the second venture where I have been uh, full time. I'm in my fifth year here at Red Zone. And so basically the agenda today, as uh, was, was requested by Sridhar, is really just tell the story a little bit about how we got uh, out of the lab and into the sewer pipes, uh, as he just said. So I'll tell you the Red Zone story, uh, share with you some of the things we've learned as we have had our share of uh, both success and, uh, and failure. And it's really, a, there's kind of two stages to this story here uh, with Red Zone. And in the earliest stages of the business, uh, we, c we made many of the, uh, the expected mistakes that you would make uh, in an early stage technology robotics based business. I'll get more into that. And kind of where we are now, uh, chapter two, uh, is where when, when we're, we're still making our share of mistakes, but when we are succeeding, it's really a fundamental focus on um, what people, what uh, actually a private equity guy told me, you know, when I, I get all these business plans, I see all this technology, and at the end of the day, we invest in the race, the horse and the jockey, meaning the market. Is it big, okay? Is it big and are there clear problems that need to be solved and can be solved with, with technology? The horse is the product that you take to market and it needs to solve an e a well-defined problem, and here's the caveat, that people will pay for, okay? So one of the businesses that I, I had the chance to talk to a while back, never got off the ground, was uh, autonomous, mowing of golf courses, okay? So uh, on one level, makes a lot of sense. A lot of golf courses, a lot of maintenance that has to be done. Um, th the need is clear. Golf courses have to be maintained. It's, a, it's done by humans for the most part. Um, so, and, and clearly this group could build a robot to mow a lawn. I saw it, okay? But then the problem for this business becomes, one, there are some needs. Uh, first of all, the people doing that task right now, it's a low cost, Labor, uh, labor pool, okay? Secondly, they would send two or three people out onto the course every morning to do the maintenance, and it had to be done by the time the first person went off to play that day, and it had to be done, had to look a certain way. So they could never get all those people out of those jobs, because in addition to cutting the grass, um, sand traps had to be raked and all kinds of things. So they actually couldn't automate enough of the task in such a way to create a compelling reason for the customer to give them a lot of money to do it. So the technology was there, but the business model was not that great. And a lot of that, a lot that we're gonna speak about today is about just that, um, making sure that there's a business model there to support the technology. Um, so the race, the horse, and the jockey, the jockey is the team. It's, it's not just the team as, as investors in private equity and venture capital uh, funds will say, it's not just the team to see you through that initial business plan, because plans go wrong. Right? It's the team to see you through the initial business plan and take you through the mistakes and the changes and the pivots in strategy and still emerge with a favorable, with a favorable business model. Um, and, and all too frequently, 
what you have with these robotics-based businesses are um, CEO, is in, CEO founder is inventor, right? And there's a little too much emotion tied to the product. You know, you say to these entrepreneurs, tell me about your business. And the response is one, well, great, I've got this product that does blank, okay? And, and as if the product is not the driver of the business, the market and that need should really be the driver of the business. And, and there's a syndrome where I talk to all these people and say, in my head, this is a person that would rather be right than rich. You know, they, they'd rather be right about the thing that they've invented and designed, the way that they invented and designed it, than maybe make some changes to that and be very, very successful. So the teams that go, that take these businesses out of the lab initially may not be the, may not be the same mix of people that get them to scale. So it's a very, it's a very difficult uh, thing for, for entrepreneurs to deal with that there might be limitations in their own abilities uh, going forward. Um, so as we talk about red zone, just um, it's easy to tell business stories in terms of comparables. Um, frequently people refer to us as like Google Earth for the underground, okay? So we do a lot of location and characterization, um, digit digitization of data. Um, we put that data in, out on the, uh, the cloud. We host it in a software platform where our clients pull it down and use it. Uh, we've got a little bit more back-end uh, work management feature functionality in the software, but just for frame of reference, uh, that might help, help the audience here. We, we are based in Pittsburgh. I think you've heard a lot already about Pittsburgh today. Uh, that's widely because Carnegie Mellon University is considered to be a robotic center of excellence, and there's a lot of uh, resources being uh, invested there in you know, giving birth to these technologies, but in a way that can create a commercial going concern. So a lot of these businesses up here, um, these businesses that I list up here, uh, they're all going concern, uh, concerns. They were all spun out of Carnegie Mellon University, very successful. And um, I mean, a lot of the people that are running these are, are friends and colleagues of mine. So uh, I think back several years ago, the Wall Street Journal uh, tagged Pittsburgh as Roboburg because we had successfully made a transition from a, um, a market and a region driven by old industry, Steeltown, you know, we're commonly referred to as, and uh, pivoted now where many, most of our new jobs are in, they're in healthcare, they're in software development, they're in robotics development. Um, so largely in part, we owe a lot of that to the university system there, but also to the fact that um, our venture capital community, our early stage investors, and our angels are highly supportive of these types of businesses. Uh, it's a unique actual uh, personality set we have where a lot of these folks that made money in old industry businesses, in steel, and businesses that are founded in uh, tangible inventories, they know that that's not the long-term success of the region. And they've taken that, that the money that they've made and do a lot of angel investing in the next generation of technologies, many of which are in fact uh, robotics based. Um, and as if you didn't know, I mean, there's all kinds of data that says robotics based businesses, it looks like a real promising sector. Uh, recent, recent research out of uh, ABI says that consumer robotics, you know, is gonna become a multi-billion dollar industry in the not too distant future. Um, I myself, I'm a business to business guy. I'm not so much B2C, but B2B. Um, frankly, I'm, I'm bullish on, on that sector as well. Um, but circling back to uh, business to consumer, I was watching a sporting event the other day, and this was after Schroeder had asked me to come here. Um, and there was actually a commercial uh, for iRobot on a network, you know, uh, network TV sporting event, uh, iRobot commercial for the, uh, for the Roomba. So uh, it's good to see that the, uh, these sectors are being elevated but I'm not quite sure if either B2B or B2C has really seen that killer app yet that really takes mobile robotics from, you know, it really deep into the mainstream. Um, as far as Red Zone goes, um, we are recognized innovators in a, in a not so innovative space as we get to talking about sewer management, um, but we've rec been recognized, uh, that's a very popular industry journal on the left there. Um, after we launched the solo robot, which we'll talk about today, Popular Science pegged this technology I'll show you as uh, one of the 26 technologies that'll help transform America's crumbling, neglected infrastructure. And then uh, while he was in the White House, Sridhar uh, was able to, gave us the, uh, 
the good benefit of uh, getting a private audience with President Obama when he came to Pittsburgh to announce that initiative on advanced, advanced manufacturing that we heard about earlier. Um, and our client base is global. Um, we're solving a problem with underground infrastructure, which is a, glo a global problem. Every developed city uh, in the world has got underground sewer infrastructure that is more often neglected than dealt with proactively. So uh, we have worked with the largest uh, cities, utilities, and en civil engineering firms um, all over the world. So how did we get here? Uh, so getting on with the story of Red Zone, uh, chapter one. So the business of Red Zone, we, it's actually been around for 25 years uh, under the same name, Red Zone Robotics, 25 years plus. Um, we were spun out of CMU uh, in 1987, funded by some angels, um, and based on the premise of some real expertise in um, mechanism, robotics, and advanced technologies, um, they, they left the lab and went to market. Um, early on, the focus was on a lot of uh, field-based tasks and um, trying to solve hard problems, you know, hard problems that people were not doing a good job with. Uh, and very quickly, the business developed a, uh, a reputable customer base doing tasks primarily focused on uh, nuclear reactor cleanup, mining condition assessment, early customers were the Department of Defense. And so, so there, was, there was momentum within the business there. Um, there was also a very heavy investment in engineering, um, and now in hindsight, and purely in hindsight, you can say that something that was then a bragging point, over 40 robots developed, uh, now was more a symptom of the disease of a lack of focus, right? Uh, the focus was on the innovation and, and the robotics, you know, as opposed to a business strategy. Um, when you're early stage and you're bootstrapping a business, getting angel money, um, frequently, there's no investment in product management. Um, guys like me are considered to be a luxury. You know, after we prove it and go to market, then we hire the sales guys for scale. But um, so they had one or two sales people. The problem is, though, um, that structure tends to make a business focus on deals rather than a market. You know, meaning sales people come back and say, "Oh my gosh, you know, I know we built the robot to do this, but if it was just a little bit different." we could get this client and you're an early stage business and you don't have a lot of revenues and you have investors to answer to. So you pivot, you do a strategy pivot to get that deal and you wind up with 40 robots and the situation that we were in and the end of the story for uh, early stage red zone uh, was unfortunate. So, uh, the business went bankrupt in the early 2000s despite the fact that uh, they had clearly built some robots that were fit to purpose. They did the task they were designed to do, but they did not open up a big market. Okay? None of those 40 robots opened up a big market. They didn't create uh, recurring revenues, all the kinds of things that you need to build a business on. So, so the next stage of Red Zone is kind of where we are right now. Um, it's, it's a story of focus and scale. Um, and so with and, and we had the good fortune at the time, whereas uh, the technologies that Red Zone had, de been, had developed, they were well known. The city of Pittsburgh uh, was going through a, uh, a process with the EPA uh, coming under a consent decree due to neglect of large sewer system, of the, of the sewer system. Uh, Alcasan came to Red Zone and said, you know, we're, we're negotiating with the EPA. Um, they say it's going to cost billions to rebuild the underground infrastructure. We don't have it. We need to get data on what's going on in the sewer system so we can make a plan that's financially responsible for the city. Um, in Pittsburgh, we have these, uh, everybody, those three rivers. We have large sewer tunnels running under those rivers, like, like, like several feet in diameter and greater. And so, and, they, and they've been in the ground since the early 1900s, so they present a big challenge. So, uh, we were kind of drawn towards the wastewater market uh, by a local client. It worked. So we, uh, we quickly sought to establish some credibility, uh, open up this market. I'll talk about, though, how we went from one, addressing one part of the problem to what is commonly referred to as bringing the whole product to market. Um, we clearly had to raise enough money and balance the investment between not just engineering, but engineering and a commercialization effort to keep the business going. Um, 
So, so wastewater collection systems, conveyance systems, this is a really fancy way to say sewer pipes, okay? So sewers are, um, the sewer pipes that are underground, typically it's the deepest of the underground infrastructure, it's under the water lines, it's under the electric. Um, everybody expects it to work, right? Everybody just expects, you know, sewer, treat, sewer, treat, sewer uh, services to be there, but I will tell you to a person, it doesn't matter where I go, it's true, uh, these services are undercharged for. Okay, water and wastewater services are grossly undercharged for. People always believe they should be free. Uh, it's not a very popular topic for politicians to want to discuss because you know you can see a pothole and talk about fixing a bridge and people feel good about that. But when you tell people that the several hundred thousand miles of water and wastewater pipes that are under the ground are deteriorating, they don't want to hear it because they can't see them. Okay, so. So it's a very large market with an acute problem of the fact that it is aging, it's been neglected, people expect the services, and they don't want to pay for them. Okay, so, so you've got a real challenge here on how to manage this infrastructure properly. Um, and, and, and so this is kind of where we apply the fact that we believe it's a perfect application according to the three Ds of robotics, right? It's a, it's a dirty, dull, and dangerous environment and market that we're going into with the dirty being self-explanatory, okay? Dull meaning, you know, repetitive, meaning there is, you know, if you inspect one line of sewer pipe, it's the same process of inspecting several hundred thousands of miles of sewer pipe. Uh, when it's done by people looking at videos, it's just mundane and repetitive. Um, it can be automated. Um, and there's a lot of danger associated with this market. Um, every time it rains in cities with insufficient sewer systems or combined sewer systems, uh, there's a violation of the Clean Water Act, and you have raw sewage spilling into rivers. It's a problem we have in Pittsburgh. So it's dangerous for the environment. It's dangerous for people. People should not be going down underground to perform tasks that can be automated. And uh, so, but right now, people commonly around the world go into sewers to clear clogs and do assessment. Uh, in Europe, there's a union certification called pipe bonger, where engineers will literally walk through pipes. First, they have to bypass the pipe, shut it down, and reroute whatever's moving through it. People go down, and they tap on the pipes. They tap it at 9, they tap it at 3, 12, and 6, and they listen for structural integrity signals, OK? So not very precise, um, not very quantifiable, and not very safe. There's, um, if you imagine those bicycles that you sit on where you lean back and there's no handlebars, bikes like that have been configured so people could pedal through sewers with lights on their heads and video cameras in their hand to do condition assessments. So clearly, the status quo is uh, low-tech and insufficient. Um, what's cool about the problem that we wind up dealing with is we're not making this up, okay? This is, this is pretty well documented that there are problems percolating underground. This is a a commonly quoted study by the American Society of Civil Engineers around the fact that lots of money is needed to maintain these systems. Um, but you know, when we look at the market problem, you know, we look at those numbers down there and say they're not showing up. Th those dollars are not coming. There's not enough federal funding to make up those gaps, uh, and you cannot raise people's water and sewer bills enough to make up those gaps. So the opportunity here is to do more with less. And another nice thing that we have going for us with our business is uh, what, what we are saying is very much in line with the regulators are promoting, okay? So uh, the EPA will say asset management is how you establish the lowest cost, long useful life plan for all these buried assets to deliver the services uh, that are required uh, from the community and from the public. And again, like I said, when these sewers fail, it's bad on many levels. Um, they, they pose threats to the environment. The way that they're dealt with now, it's very manual. Um, it's actually a data challenge. And I'm going to get into this a little bit more with, when we talk about the whole product. Um, our customers, we get a lot of attention for these robots. But our customers, they don't really want robots. They want answers. <laughs> they want answer to the question, which is, well, how much do I have to invest to keep those sewers working over a long period of time, and where might the problems be in terms of potential structural failures? So there's an information deficit, and there's no system of record. At a time when you know, lots of things are automated and data is stored centrally, 
Um, the system of record for most of our clients who are, again, municipalities, cities, utilities, um, is a stack of paper maps and a few employees that have been working there for 30, 40 years. Okay, so that's, that certainly doesn't scale, uh, but that's, that's the modus operandi in most cities. So again, so this is a need of information, uh, and we're building these robots to go extract the information, but again, this is where you have to watch the, uh, the gravitational pull towards the coolness of the technology, because frequently we get a lot of people saying, well, if the robot would do this, it would be great, and if it would do that, it would be better. Add sensors, add features. But you know, in our market, you know, we use the phrase, uh, good enough is perfect. We have a good enough is perfect customer base because we're talking about public funds, right? There's only so much money available to um, remediate these pipes in a community. And so if it costs a few hundred dollars to just dig up and replace a pipe, there's only so much of that money you're gonna spend on assessing that pipe, right? So we could really trick out the robots with lots of sensors, but then there'll be a marginal utility in terms of return for the business if people don't see value and they're not willing to pay for that information. So you, we constantly, and I think entrepreneurs need to constantly balance the, the coolness of what they can build with the reality of what the customer base is willing to pay. And again, it, the fact that we sell to customers who are generally using public funds to fund our solutions, uh, it keeps us keenly aware of that because you see these, these budgets are all public knowledge. So we got into this market, you know, working with the uh, Allegheny County Sewer Authority, we quickly wanted to establish our credibility. So our flagship product kind of went boldly where no people had gone before. If you think about sewers as a market, um, there's enormous sewers, like three inches in diameter and bigger, and then there's much smaller lines. Um, our first foray into this field was in the big lines, the ones that, you know, huge consequence of failure, extremely dangerous environment for people. And um, we, we took one of those earlier stage robots that you saw there that had a uh, history of going into nuclear reactors to do assessment at the core and configured it to go through sewers. Um, this is not fully autonomous. Uh, like, like uh, the current version of the robot that I'll show you now. Uh, it's remote operated uh, by an operator, but it goes down into pipes. It gathers super important quantifiable information uh, about what is going on in that pipe. So the sensor set that we send in, you know, and, and again, the alternative is video images of a 10 foot diameter sewer pipe. So the problem is an evenly corroded pipe looks like a good pipe on video. When you look at a video of a pipe that's maybe very evenly corroded because of the presence of hydrogen sulfide gas, you might just look at that, the evenness of, that, of the inside of that pipe and say, this pipe is okay for another so many years. But the fact is, when you use a laser to get a very precise internal measurement of that, ro of that pipe, um, and you use sonar to quantify the amount of debris and stuff that's built up inside the pipe, Couple that with images and hydrogen sulfide gas detection, because it's a very corrosive gas in sewer pipes, uh, you, get this, uh, you get this offering that we coin MSI, multi-sensor inspection. And, and again, the alternative to everything that you could do with people in pipes. And so we showed up uh, with this solution to go into big pipes, and we very quickly established credibility in this market, because again, the, uh, prior to us coming in with this, you're talking about people and non-quantifiable results for critical infrastructure. So uh, check that in the box of a success in terms of the technology. Now in terms of the business, um, it was a modest success because underground, um, only 10% of the pipes, under, less than 10% of the pipes underground are what you would consider to be very big pipe, uh, the perfect market for this product. And, and also, the customers didn't necessarily buy assessment services the way we wanted to sell them at this time, which was we just came around looking to inspect the big pipe. And they would say, well, yeah, we're going to inspect some pipe this year. Uh, some of it's going to be big, and some of it's going to be medium, and some of it's going to be small. We'd like to give you that project, Red Zone. And we'd say, well, uh, we only do the big, you know, and, and they didn't really like that because they wanted to give it to one vendor. So, so we had a, a market problem and a problem, you know, going forward because the, the long-term goals of Red Zone weren't going to be met in, in that size market. So we had to uh, make some changes and make sure that, again, 
the, the race that we were accessing a large market, so we invented this product. Uh, this is called the Solo Robot. This is the one that we uh, presented to the president when he, when he came. And uh, this is a completely autonomous inspection device that's used in the most common sized sewer pipes. So 80% uh, of the sewers underground are between 8, 10, and 12 inches of internal diameter. Uh, and this device, which weighs less than 20 pounds, was designed to survey those pipes autonomously. Um, one, I believe it's one of the only fully autonomous mobile robots that is, you know, that is commercially available uh, in a business-to-business -business environment. And what we were going after was a status quo um, depicted here. So over on the far side there, you can see how that's how that's the setup of how the sewer pipes that we go into with this robot had been assessed. You backed up a big, you know, truck, you know, just imagine a good humor ice cream truck, right? With a few thousand feet of a fiber optic cable on it, you'd have a few, uh, two or three people would come, pop the manhole, set up all the traffic cones, feed the camera through, and, and a remote operator in the truck would drive the camera, see a defect, stop, notate, ooh, there's a crack 30 feet in the pipe. Stop, keep going, oh, there's a, looks like somebody hammered a, an, an illegal tap in the pipe, 100 feet into in the pipe. So all this work is being done in the field. It's very disruptive to traffic. It's very manual. And, and that picture on the far left is something that you will see in most cities today. Um, this picture uh, closer to me over here is a picture of a sewer CCTV camera set up in 1967. Okay. So from then to now, not a lot of change. You know, I talked about the fact that it's not a very innovative industry because there's not a lot of money available for this task, not for the assessment as opposed to what they spend on fixing it. Um, sewers, are, sewers are one of the least popular, you know, you got um, water. Before you talk about sewers, you talk about the treatment plant, then the sewer pipes. So um, it's a very, very manual process that we went into. Uh, we started designing the solo robot in 2006 off of plans that you see on the far side of there. Uh, in 2009, it was fully launched, made, made commercially available. Uh, and, and just a few other things. Um, it's a green technology, so it's battery operated. Um, we are able to f uh, force multiply the assessment efforts, whereas uh, that setup I showed you there might get 1,500 feet of data a day in a very manual process. We can get 7,000, 8,000, 10,000 feet a day. It all depends on how many robots we put in the ground and how fast the engineers that we're serving need the data. Again, um, many manholes and sewer pipes go uninspected because the access points are in the woods, they're behind people's houses, they're in alleyways, so now you can carry this to places where you couldn't uh, drive that truck and our clients are being recognized uh, all over the nation for their success. But, but the one thing I want to point out is the, the notion of, of the whole product. And you know, we started out, you start out typically um, having this expected product, but it turns out in order to really satisfy the customer, captivate the, that customer, and make for a sticky business, you, you frequently have to do things that you hadn't planned on, right? So whereas you think you're building a product, it turns out you might need other services, support type things. So on, on the other side there, you can see, well, we set out to build a sewer robot, and what we found was uh, we needed a, a, a very rich set of sensors uh, we, we actually needed software also because the customers want data. So if you take, extract data from a pipe and put it in a paper report and it goes on a shelf, you didn't, really, you didn't really change the game. You answered a question, but you didn't really make the customer smarter. So we needed all these things. Um, we needed to integrate with uh, maps, GIS information systems. Uh, we needed to finance this because, again, the clients would say to us, great, I want all the information that would otherwise take me 20 years to get or just be unattainable, but I can't afford it right now. So we had to figure out a way to offer financing services, all of this to just make sure that we could sell the robot to perform its tasks. So now, um, very few people actually buy the robot from us. They buy a program uh, called Your Entire System um, where we come in and do a baseline characterization for a city of the entire sewer system. Uh, we can deploy uh, local labor to, to, to put this robot in the ground. Um, 
and we give them a baseline, and this goes up in a software application. So the robots get deployed, uh, the defects get characterized, we put it out into the cloud, and now the engineers in the city log on to a website and they say, show me where the worst pipes are, and I'll do my long-term capital planning and my rehab planning, and I'll plan how I'm gonna clean the pipe and remove the roots, et cetera. So again, it's that, that whole notion of the whole product as opposed to just the product. And typically, if you wanna go capture a market, uh, that task-based robot, might, it might perform the task, but it might not open up the market. And this brings to bear questions of, uh, are you going to be a product business or a service business? It's one of the reasons teams fail. I mentioned teams earlier because um, you'd look at this and say, it makes for a nice product company, but really we're a tech-enabled service company. Our clients, they want information. They like the robots, good for a lot of attention, but uh, that's really what we are selling is information. Uh, and, we, and so this is, this is the software system now. We have a turnkey approach where the robots go underground, the information is extracted, and then everything is pushed out on the web. So that's the money shot now. Our clients go into this software application and can very easily queue up where their biggest problems are, assign a price to the way that they would either repair, refurbish, or replace those pipes, and make sure they're doing a smart spend of the public's money uh, going forward. Um, not time for demonstrations there. The only other thing I want to say about the business model is, um, you know, most of you are probably familiar with Jeffrey Moore crossing the chasm. I mean, these are important fundamental concepts to know kind of where are you in your market chasm. And, and the, the principle here is that um, a lot of companies suffer because they believe that the majority market will buy from them for the same exact reasons that their first customers did. And that is Really never the case. So early on, uh, innovators and early adopters, when you're trying to prove it, these are visionary people who buy the promise of something new. They're, they're, they're the minority. You're talking about less than 15% of a market are these kinds of risk takers. For the most part, in any market, be it robotics or software-based for technologies, uh, the majority market where you need to prosper, they're saying, who like me has done this before and reaped a benefit, okay? So again, so you kind of, you prove it early, but you prosper when you've done it many times and many times over. And these people, when they buy early, um, they'll deal with some mistakes, you know, but we made a mistake, a couple of mistakes at Red Zone where we took the concept to some cities and they said, no, I get it, it's never been done before, um, I'll, I'll work with you on this. But then when the robot got stuck and the data didn't show up the right way, you know, they were very upset. They were, so they were, they were majority market buyers, you know, pretending to be early adopters. So it's important that you find the right people that you can work with to prove it. But then, you know, it's, it's also important to know what that majority expects when you're really seeking to scale the business. Okay, so um, I think that's, that's important to keep in mind. And so where are we right now? So right now we are a going concern. Um, this autonomous robot is at, is at the core of, of the growth of our business. We're focused on our financial performance. Uh, we're trying to drive raging references through our client base to kind of help evangelize um, the offering that we have to the market. Uh, we're trying to expand our reach, grow market share, and, um, and constantly we're still faced with the challenges we talked about earlier. Every day somebody says, um, you know, on, on this device we've got um, cameras, proximity sensors, inclinometers, uh, tilt and roll sensors, payout monitors. We put a laser on here when we need to get a certain amount of information. Every day somebody says, you know, though, it would be great if it would stop and repair the damages that it saw. It would be great if when it came upon a big pile of debris, it would start cleaning it up, right? And, you know, I'm sure that people that we work with in our office and back at Carnegie Mellon can make it do that. I'm not so sure that would give us a better opportunity um, as the business. So we really fight to maintain our focus. Um, we do maintain a disciplined approach to alternative markets because people do come to us and say, well, if it's working in a sewer pipe, can it work in a, uh, a, a, a potable water pipe, an oil or a gas pipe and other things like that. So, so we try to maintain a disciplined approach to alternative markets and, uh, but just try to stick to our knitting, the fundamentals, make sure we keep trying to solve the problems uh, of this very large market that we have. And that's it. <laughs>
aviation is the largest manufacturing export of the United States and generates about 3 percent of the world's G GDP. So it's economically important, and since now I work for a company, that's an excuse enough to talk about it.